let's start with a question from Jim. I was having a discussion with a Jehovah's Witness friend who pointed to Hebrews 1.5, which references Psalm 2.7, as evidence that Jesus is a created being. It says, I have become your father, which would indicate that the father was not always a father, and therefore Jesus was not present at a certain time. Does this contradict the Trinity? Um, that reading, of course, would. And uh, if he's reading, uh, I have become your father, obviously he's reading from the New World Translation. Now, just as an aside, that's the Jehovah's Witness trans- translation. That is a corrupt translation. I'm just saying. Um, no other Greek scholars agree with their take on certain passages that are meant to deflect reference to the divinity of Christ. Uh, now, I'm reading the New American Standard, which is a very careful and precise um, literal translation, and some it, it's some would say uh, almost a wooden translation. They think it reads a little stiff because it's trying to be as precise as possible. And there it says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, the word father isn't in there, all right? It, the word is monogonus. That means uh, only, let's see. Oh, actually, I don't know what the word is in this particular case. Uh, only begotten is is monogonus. Um, but in the Greek, that's not that's one word, not two. So only isn't ref, referring, modifying begotten. Rather, it's only begotten. It's one of a kind is the point there. Okay, so this may be different in this passage. But in any event, <clears throat> let's just say, uh, you are my son. Today I, I have become a father to you. That means Jesus came into existence at some point in the past. And that would mean also then that Jesus is not divine. He is a created being. Okay, that would be their point from this verse. Um, part of the difficulty, even from the internal evidence of Hebrews chapter 1, is the rest of the passage. So let me just start at the beginning, all right? God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions, in many ways, in the last days, has spoken to us in his Son. Okay, so far so good. J.W.'s, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Okay, Jesus was the one who made everything. All right, I should say the Word made everything. Jesus is the Word become flesh. And he, the Word, verse 3, is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the Word of his power. Whoa. Now, that doesn't sound like a created being. That's the introduction to this section. Then in verse 5, you are my son, today I have begotten you. What does that mean? I'm not sure. Okay. And in fact, I sometimes get tripped up with begotten language because I don't know what to do with it always in a context. But sometimes with hermeneutics, when you're studying scripture carefully, you may not be able to determine what a word does mean but from the context, you can eliminate options about what you can make. You can show what it doesn't mean by eliminating options. Okay. So if we're saying this means Jesus was created and therefore he wasn't divine, then how is it that he could be the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and uphold all things by the word of his power? How could that apply to a created being? Okay, but I continue. And he, verse 6, and he again brings the firstborn, monogonus. Firstborn means means preeminent one. It doesn't mean the first one born. That's why in your English it's one word. Into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Really? You wor- The angels are supposed to worship the Son? Hmm. 
uh, but of the Son, he says, verse 8, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. So David is calling this one God, who is anointed by God. Okay? You, Lord, verse 10, in the beginning, laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. So all of these sentences, apart from just setting aside verse 5, today I've begotten you, or today I've become a father to you in the New World Translation, <clears throat> all of them seem to point very powerfully towards the divinity of Jesus, or of the Word who became Jesus, all right? And that he was the creator. Now, I know what Jehovah's Witnesses are going to say. Yes, God first created the Word, and then the Word was the one through whom all else were, was created. All right? He was the vehicle. Okay, now you go back to, I think, Isaiah 45, which has a bunch of verses there that are favorites of Jehovah's Witnesses. It says, I'm the one who created, I and I alone, okay, <laughs> of Jehovah God. I can turn there. Uh, maybe, but I, instead I'm just going to turn to John chapter 1, because that is the prologue for the biography of Jesus. And John chapter 1 starts this way, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word, by the way, notice the similarity between the beginning of Jesus' life and the beginning of the story in Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's what we got at the beginning of the story. Here's how Jesus' life is begun by John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses want to put an article there. He was a God. Okay, keep reading. He was in the beginning with God. All Verse 3, all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. <clears throat> now, that is completely univocal, <clears throat> meaning there's only one way to understand verse 3. You can fuss all you want about the Greek in verse 1, God or a God. Verse 3 is not ambiguous even in the New World Translation. And apart from him, and clearly this means apart from his agency, apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In other words, the Word is responsible for every single thing that exists. So when you look at the Hebrews passage, which includes two references to the Word creating everything that was ever created, or creating everything, the world and the heavens, etc., etc. Then you go back to John chapter 1, verse 3, and you realize it's not just that he created everything, but he created everything that was every, ever created. Mm -hmm. Then you can't say, but he was first created by God, and he is a created being who created everything else. So that creates a conflict, their take of Hebrews, even if I can't make any sense of, all right, what does verse 5 mean when it says, today I have begotten you? All the other things, the exact representation of his nature upholds all things by the word of his power. The angels worship him. God, my God has, etc., and all that other stuff. Then two references to creating everything. And then when you go back to John, it says, this one also called the word created everything that's ever been created. And you go back to Isaiah, and he said, God says, I created all by myself. This kind of cements the doctrine, biblically, that the Word is the God of Scripture. Even if I'm still a little bit ambiguous, or the passage is ambiguous to my understanding, about having been begotten. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thoughts on that, Amy? I'm going to turn to Isaiah 45, where you're sharing. If 
if you have something to well, offer. Well, I, I came across something, <laughs> and I'm not quite sure what to make of this yet. But um, this is what it says in Acts 13, 32, and 33, because it actually talks about uh, today I have begotten you, and it puts in a certain context. Here's what it says. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children and that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So here in Acts, he's comparing this, you are my son, today I have begotten you, to the idea that he raised Mm. up Jesus as a fulfillment of Uh his promise. And so I think it could be, basically the simply the installation of Jesus as our king um, kind of when he's the heir of all the promises of God after he completes what he's done and he's raised from the dead in fact even if you go back to Psalm 2 7 um, starting in Mm -hmm. verse 6 but as for me I have installed my king upon Zion my holy mountain I will surely tell the decree of the Lord He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. So even in that case, Mm. it doesn't sound like a creation moment. It sounds like he's talking about, you know, he says, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And then he says, you know, today I've begotten you, and then ask of me and receive the inheritance. Even there, it sounds like he's talking about his his installation as the heir of all the promises of God, um, which, you know, back in Acts, they say has to do with his being raised from the dead. Well, that's, uh, see, now that adds more, that adds more um, clarity, I think. So my approach was to say, even if begotten is a mystery, it can't mean created. Mm -hmm. And here's the reasons why. Even in the context of Hebrews 1, we have all of these kinds of references that indicate that this one being spoken of is God himself, which is why the angels worship him, why he's the creator of these different things, and why he's characterized as having the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. Then going back to John chapter 1, you see in more clarity that the Word was the one responsible for creating everything that was ever created. Therefore, the Word is the uncreated creator. Now, this wouldn't make any sense unless the Word was God. But if the Word was God, then God is the creator, Yes, through the medium of the second person, who is also God. And what you did is took it another step and say, well, we can find some more clarity about the begotten part by looking at the way the concept of begottenness, particularly out of Psalm 2, is referred to in other circumstances in Scripture. So that fleshes it out that way. So what we have here is a Jehovah's Witness standing, balancing on one verse— so to speak, with their translation, which is, uh, you know, is questionable, all right? And even if we go with that, I became a father to you, they then read that as being created in time and therefore not being divine. And they're standing there with their blinders on regarding all the other verses in that passage and the other texts that help us to understand something about the nature of this one called the Word and the nature of begottenness. The only way that the Jehovah's Witness can hang on to this as supporting Jesus being created, or I should say the Word being a created being, is is to balance on that verse on their tippy toes <laughs> and not fall into any other passages that relate to this issue and say, well, this is the way it is. Um, our way of approaching this, and I've said this many times, solves the textual problem. The Trinity is a solution. It's not a problem. It's the only way of understanding all of these texts that both Jehovah's Witnesses and Christians hold to be inspired. Um, it, it's the only way of holding them all together so there is no contradiction. And the, the way they avoid contradiction is by changing the translation. I know that sounds like a harsh thing to say, but that's what they do. 
they change the translation. Now, as it turns out, they can't change everything. And you can go through the New World Translation even in uh, John chapter 1, verse 3, and you can make the point that Jesus is the uncreated creator right from their own translation. Now, we have a piece on our website regarding those first uh, opening verses of John and Jesus' divinity, the words divinity. Um, I've written a piece called The Deity of Christ case closed. But I have included that material in the new book, uh, and uh, that Street Smart's coming out in June. So um, because uh, I have two chapters on Jesus, challenges regarding Jesus, and one of them is Jesus is the, the divinity of Christ, and that's challenged by Muslims and Jehovah's Witnesses and in a certain fashion from LDS and in other groups that uh, identify in some way with Christianity but are not Christian. So... Uh, so this is a very good argument, and uh, I, I got it from the late Bob Passantino, actually, and it's an ancient argument, you know, and he passed it on to me, and uh, so I've, I've, I've leveraged it quite often to make this wonderful point that Jesus is God, clearly stated by John, identifying the Word as the uncreated creator, which Word then became flesh and dwelt among us. And even if you don't go to John, as you've pointed out, in Hebrews, you just have to look at the context there of what he's talking about, making the point that he's greater than all of these other created beings.